Yeah. All right, I guess I'm supposed to introduce you guys here. I'm Tom. I'm filming it for Mark on the Insane Asylum, and we're here with Tobias and Emily Wayland. Hey, how's it going, guys? Good. Thanks for having us. Good. We're going to be talking about your book. I have a story about a Lake Michigan Mothman coming up, and uh, I guess yeah. we're going to going to get into uh, the singular. How do you pronounce that? Is that Fortean Society? I've always said Fortean, and uh, and okay. the reason is um, because you know it's based on uh, the name of Charles Fort, and so I just thought you know if you turn that into an, an adjective or something, then. You would say his name and then just add the, the suffix to it. So Fortean, I think. Yep. So what is a Fortean then? Sure. So for anybody not familiar with uh, the work of Charles Fort, he was an early 20th century collector of weird news stories. And uh, so he would collect all of these weird news stories from, from all over the world, and he would compile them into these massive volumes. And uh, he would write about them, sort of speculate uh, what he thought was behind them, find commonalities. And, uh, and he found quite a few commonalities. And so one of his most famous quotes uh, is, one measures a, a circle beginning anywhere. And, and that is to say that by examining one aspect of the paranormal, you can understand something about all of it because there does seem to be uh, connections uh, between seemingly, uh, you know, otherwise disparate uh, phenomena within this, this uh, larger subject. So um, that's, that's where uh, the term Fortean comes from, is sort of anybody who wants to approach things from that same perspective. And so we don't specialize in any one area like cryptozoology or ufology okay. or psychology or anything. Um, we're all, uh, we're, we're just very interested in all of it. Um, and so, you know, we, uh, we, we study everything and then we find connections uh, uh, when, when they exist. And, uh, and actually, that's a, a lot of what uh, the latest book that we put out, uh, Strange Tales of the Impossible, deals with is all of these different weird reports that we've investigated over the, the past few years and all of the, the weird commonalities that, that you can sort of find uh, between them. So where's the line drawn? Do you draw it at like aliens or... Line in terms of uh, paranormal. Term. What do you consider in that circle? Oh, I just put everything in. Yeah. Um, any everything. Like, any, well, a two-headed dog. We're sitting there. Sure, sure. <laughs> so, I mean, if, if if you sort of look at the 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 um, etymology or, or the, the the root of the the word paranormal, um, you know, it, it literally means anything outside of normal. You know, it, 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 people have sort of uh, adopted that word to exclusively mean like ghosts and, and spirits and, and, and things, you know, similar to, to those subjects. But the fact is, I think a much more uh, accurate way to use that word would just to be any, uh, anything outside of, of normal, you know. So, yeah, I mean, two-headed dogs, uh, Bigfoot, aliens. Uh, ghosts and hauntings, uh, time slips, uh, any anything you want to do sort of in that realm outside of uh, established normality, I think you could you could easily put in that sphere. I once egged the house and I threw the egg and it bounced off the siding onto the concrete and didn't break. Paranormal. <laughs> Call it. Paranormal. It's got to be. I threw it from 40 yards. It counts. I mean, that's weird. That's outside of normal. It That's absolutely. The last is. time I I was nineteen, and I remember saying, "I retire from egging houses." This is it. Yeah, you got to go out on top. <laughs> absolutely. Or it was a sign, like you should really not get off. Yeah, I'll yeah. Okay, a, I'll take right. a hint from the universe. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. So tell us a little bit about Mothman in Lake Michigan, because this one hits home with me that a lot of people don't know this story with me, but I'd like to hear uh, how that happened, because now I'm curious right. to read it. Yeah, like we first uh, heard about winged humanoid sightings uh, in that area in the spring of 2017. And so at that time, I was uh, you know writing news articles for the Singular Fortean Society, and uh, it was brought to my attention that uh, MUFON had um, 
uh, released these three cases that had come through their case management system. And uh, they all described these weird uh, winged creatures that uh, that people had reportedly seen uh, in in Chicago. And uh, MUFON had published a short article about it. And so I picked up the story uh, through them and, um, you know, I wrote a, a, a little article for it uh, for the, the Singular Fortean Society. And I thought our readers would get a kick out of it. And, um, you know, I really thought it was going to be just one of those weird things that, you um, that you just never heard about again, right? You know, just this weird one-off sighting, and then that was the end of it. Uh, but that's that's not what happened. You know, it was very soon after that we started seeing more reports coming uh, through places like Phantoms and Monsters, uh, UFO Clearinghouse, uh, MUFON had had more reports after that, and and, and even other places. You know, we've had uh, other people um, like the National Cryptid Society or the Pine Barrens Institute who have uh, actually. Um, been able to like refer witnesses to us. So like these reports have come into a, a variety of, of, of different organizations at this point. But, um, but yeah, for us, it started in that spring um, when everything just sort of kicked off and, you know, sort of very much outside of that investigation at, at, at that time, you know, cause I was just covering it journalistically. And I, I reached out to uh, Talon and Manuel uh, separately. So Lon Strickler from Phantoms and Monsters right. and then Paul Navarat from UFO Clearinghouse. And, uh, and I, I interviewed those guys separately. Uh, they were both very uh, uh, polite and forthcoming, you know, when I, I, I interviewed them. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really just wanted to be able to reach out, sort of do my due diligence and, and see what they had to say uh, about what people were, were seeing at that time. And so, you know, um, they didn't really have strong opinions at that time regarding sort of what was behind everything. And, and uh, I, I respected that, you know, because it didn't seem like they were going into it with a, a whole lot of bias, really the, the main point they were trying to make, you know, very early in this investigation seemed to be that people are seeing something and, and what that is, we have no idea. And so um, oops. You would have thought I would have turned my phone on silent considering how many times I've been interviewed. And yet it still manages to get me now and again. Sorry about that. And um, <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, it's, uh, it wasn't too long after I had, had interviewed them and, and, and we published those interviews, uh, you know, to the, the singer of the 40 society, uh, society website that, um, you know, uh, we started getting our own, reports and uh and next thing you know like we sort of find out we have uh, uh some mutual friends who are traveling the same circles lon asked us if given our proximity to the sightings and the fact that we're getting our, our own reports um if we wouldn't mind actually joining this investigation and uh, and so we did and um we've been doing it ever since it's not the only thing we we do but it's been a, a very prolific investigation so far um uh, could would you mind if I shared my uh, personal story with you and then tell no, me how it stacks up? Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. All right. I've always told everybody before I tell this story, if it wasn't for my friend Jen being with me, no one would have ever heard this story if I was alone. But since there were two people corroborating it, uh, I, I do tell people now, otherwise I'd look like an idiot. But we got on a health kick and we were walking every night, me and my friend Jen. We lost a ton of weight. It was awesome. So looking for new ways to walk around Jackson, Wisconsin. Are you, are you, do you know where that is? Okay. So they were building a new subdivision and it's just fun to walk down like a gravel road. You know, it's very dark. We're walking down a gravel road. It tees to a major road at the end and there's new construction and it's about 10 o'clock at night, 2005 summertime, beautiful out. And I start hearing uh, in the new construction, I hear a radio turn on and start going. And I'm like, that's weird. And I'm like, you know, I work construction. And if these guys are dumb enough to leave the radio on at night, I'm going to grab myself a new radio. <laughs> so I, I start walking up and the music just gets like insanely loud, like deafening loud. And I... I can see something because there's a major highway way down the road and it tees. And I see something when a headlight comes, there's a shadow figure there. And I start to tell my friend Jen, like, I see something down there. And when I go to open the 
the new construction door, the hair on my arm stand up. The music is so loud. It's Tom Petty free fallen. And my friend Jen like pulls at me to run. And I'm like, hold on, wait for a car to come. I need to see what this thing is, where we're going. And there's no street lights, no anything. And I see it again. And it's just a winged creature way down at the bottom of the road. And it takes off and starts flying. And we take off running towards, you know, where we parked in this subdivision. And I'm thinking... Jen is a lot faster than I expected her to be. I thought I was I was a forward in soccer at the time. I thought I was going to blow by her, but I didn't. And she puts her hand on me and says, stop. And we stop. And this thing circles around. We can see it through the moonlight and the stars. It was a clear night. It's got red eyes, wings that aren't flapping. And it flies across the road in front of us and lands in a tree. And it was really weird because it landed in a tree and I I go hunting a lot. So I'll see turkeys in the morning and they're only like 30 pounds, but they're, they break branches and they're noisy. This thing silently, delicately landed in the tree. And that is the only way back to the car. And we're as far to the side of the road, up to the woods on the other side as we can get. And as we're walking, I see one red eye, like it's looking forward. And I'm kind of running. And then you can see both red eyes because I saw it tilt its head and look right at me. And I got like nauseated and we took off running. And that's the last we saw of it. Wow. Uh, did you get a sense of how big this thing was? Um, yeah, I believe it would be about eight feet tall. If I That is enormous. Wow. Interesting. Now, that uh, oh. that. Um, did you like? Yeah, did you was... hear the, the the radio, or did you just hear it? I just heard it. Never saw a radio. Nothing. We never went in the house. The door was locked. They put those old doors on there. But as soon as I touched the handle, that's when like electricity went through me, and it was just so loud. Like it was. It wasn't like it was coming in the house anymore. It was like it was just like you're in a department store radio. You know, it was just part of the world. <laughs> it's weird. Interesting. Yeah, you know, like we've got uh, a couple of cases that have reported uh, like some weird radio interference. Yeah, well, yeah, I was gonna just kind of like weird EMF kind of stuff, you know, like like uh, uh, electrical interference and, and things like that. Uh, like Emily said, uh, 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 radio interference has been one where these two young women. This was just in uh, uh, Oregon, Wisconsin, actually were uh, out driving would have been last Thanksgiving. Um, so Thanksgiving, uh, 2020 and, uh, and they're out cruising around out outside of Oregon. Cause there's nothing to do in, in Oregon. Yeah. If you're 18, I lived you know, there for about five years, there's, there was never anything to do. Not even back in the eighties. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, um, and so like they're out cruising around and they notice, uh, in this one spot, like their radio keeps, uh, uh, like freaking out basically. So it would get all staticky and then it would start playing a, a different station, like all the way at the other end of the, the, the dial. And um, in that spot is where they had their, their weird sighting, you know, as they drove through it, they saw this huge winged uh, humanoid creature, as they said, like swoop down in front of them over the, the, the road. And then um, as they kept you know, driving around. Cause again, that's just what they were doing. Um, eventually like they went back to that same spot to see if, if they could see it again after they kind of calmed down, you know, and, um, and they, and one of the, the, the young women actually said that she saw this thing standing out in a, a, a field, but it, it, it just reminds me of, of your experience because of the, the strangeness of the, the radio like i mean why why would it do that right it, and an yeah. in, in interesting uh follow-up to that actually is so emily and i went out there of course because that's what we do and uh, you know I, I i had interviewed both of these these women on the the phone first and then you know it was in the middle of covid so um you know i was like well if you're comfortable going out there with us that's fine we can wear masks and everything but they really weren't and i, I completely understood of course and so I was like, look, like, that's great. You just, you told us where it was. We'll just go out there and we'll see what there is to see. 
And so, you know, we, we drove their route and, and, and went through this intersection and, and everything. And I didn't notice anything unusual right away, but we got home and we were uh, reviewing all of our recording equipment. And uh, we noticed that there was this weird like hissing and like popping and, and like crackling sound over all of our audio. And this is across like multiple devices. It wasn't anything in the, the, the car causing it. And so it was just something causing this weird audio interference in, in all of all of our cameras, um, which we still can't explain it. And the weird thing is, of course, once this happened once, we were like, well, hell, we have to go back. Of course we do. And so it was what, maybe a couple of weeks later, yeah. we, 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 we went back, did the exact same thing, drove the, the exact same route, had all of the, the, the same devices, which, of course, we had used previously and since. Um, and they work fine and they don't record anything weird. Uh, and in, again, in that one spot, uh, we had the same interference, but this time it was much quieter. And what's really interesting about that interference too, is there's this invisible boundary basically surrounding this, this intersection seemingly where we like, everything's fine. No audio interference whatsoever. We cross this invisible boundary and all of a sudden it just starts up. We go through this like intersection and at some point, like we must cross out of it because it stops. And then we turn around and go back through this, like this spot again, cross that invisible barrier, bam, audio interference. And so it was just so strange. And that second time, you know, like we're looking for anything that we can Where find. It? That Where might be curious. You, do you remember the road, the intersections? Oh boy, you know what? I don't remember it off the top of my head, but you know, I could find it pretty easily and 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 you know, send it to you if if you're interested in checking it out. Well, um, I grew up out there, you know. Okay. I know a little a uh, little bit about history about Oregon and it's kind of got some strange things that could cause some of the interference you're talking about. Oh, interesting. Okay. You know, okay. Um, for one, um Oregon was most of Oregon was built on a swamp. Okay. Okay. Uh, we had to have suck pumps in all of our basements. The power would go out, the streets would flood. You know, the whole town would flood. You know, sure. Downpour. Um, hmm. uh, you go out, it, you had to be real careful mowing your back lawns, you know, your backyards and stuff like this because they had. Um, it, it was like uh, you could see the cement. It was like a cement slab that kind of raised the lawn a little bit or kept it from sinking too far. Mm. And then if you think about it, the other thing, you go out too far on 138, which is between Oregon and Stoughton, the highway between Oregon and Stoughton, you'll get too close to the speedway, you're going to find a lot of radio interference. Oh, for sure. The race okay. track. This was... Um... This was the intersection of Sand Hill Road and Rutland Dunn Town Line Road. So I just, I just, I just looked it up. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and so what's your theory on that? So you part think of that was part of that was uh, part of the part of the marshy area. Okay. I was. Yeah, it didn't seem like there wasn't really much out there. You know, um, it was relatively. I, mean, I, I I wouldn't describe it as necessarily isolated. Like it, it was fairly isolated in, in that it's it's a rural area. There aren't a ton of houses, you know, up there. Yeah, and it, but you know, and, and and there weren't any like there wasn't a, a major highway or anything right next to it. Um, we were we were we were a ways off the highway. Um, so I, I I don't know. You know, when when we were out there again, I was looking for anything that 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 might have caused this yeah. this interference. You know, so we're looking for like ham radio towers. And huge satellite dishes, and uh, you know, we drive up that road several times, up and down. Oh, so many times, yeah. Or like, you know, just even like huge electrical transformers, like anything at all that that's going to be putting off the 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 kind of like EMF. Out there. But yeah, one, no, there really wasn't. We couldn't find any road that's mostly um, one small road that's a lot of manufacturing type foundry type buildings. And then probably the biggest alarm out in Oregon would be up at Oak Hill. You know, the prison up there. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have a good hypothesis as to what caused it um, because we're, we couldn't find any explanation. It's it's just unexplained, basically, yeah. at, at, at right. this point. Um, say that way. 
the one thing that was interesting that I would say um, that I, I like, I do like to point out to people though, is the fact that the second time that we went back, it was much quieter. Um, and, and that I found very interesting, which is why we're actually going back there again this month uh, at the, the, the one year anniversary, uh, because I want to see if it's still there or, or if it's gone, you know, because. Uh, or if it it's even weaker, do you think? Yeah. Or something. Think it could yeah, be like, like residual it, it energy. Deep. Maybe, you know, like the, the, the first thing that occurred to me when um, it was uh, like when we went out there and noticed how quiet it was, was, you know, hey, is this something that's that's fading? You know what I mean? Like was was whatever this phenomenon was that that these two young women interacted with, um, you know, what was it present in a stronger form when they interacted with it? And it's been fading ever since. Um, and so that's kind of what, what I want to see when, when we go out there again is, you know, uh, is that audio interference there at all? Is it, uh, is it much weaker? Will it be really strong again? Maybe it's, it's cyclical with the, the, the time of year or something, who knows? I mean, that's, that's why we have to keep going back and, and just sort of try to, to, to track these trends. Is there any way to track uh, the decay rate over the three times you go and put that with, decay rate of anything on the periodic table i mean maybe uh for 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 this specifically um you know i it, it's got to be some kind of uh radiation i would think to be interacting you know with the the uh, uh electronic devices that that we have you know like if it's if it's interfering with our audio i mean it, it's got to be somewhere on that that uh that em spectrum right and so um, yeah, I was I was thinking the same thing, but the only thing that got me away from the radiation was those right. decay rates are like five thousand years. You know, it wouldn't be. That's why you almost right. got to go to. Well, if it else. was because there are things that will that that can create, you know, that like like the 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 waves you find on on that spectrum, right? And so if something yeah. was was creating this this radiation sort of as a maybe as a byproduct of something else so if uh and this is all speculative everybody so like don't quote me on this and, and use yeah. it against me later you know i'm just we're That's just we're just is. following ideas right oh it is so, so if, if, if you were you know looking at say uh something like like a, a portal or something like say there's a portal right. a, a parallel universe and 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 the byproduct of this portal was was uh, you know radiating this 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 type mm -hmm. of energy that was interfering with our uh, audio uh, uh, stuff and and was making these these young women's radio go haywire. Um, then that portal closes, right? Uh, and it's not it's not pumping out this 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 radiation anymore. Or it's not radiating this this energy. Um, then you would expect that to to, to maybe fade over time. Um, you know, kind of just. Uh, uh, be dispersed into the environment to where people don't even notice it. And then it just fades away entirely. Right. Um, and so we'll, like, we will definitely see, you know, like uh, I'm, I'm interested to know what's, what's going to happen if, uh, well, if it's there at all. Anymore. Like using your example, if it's a portal, you know, that interference could only be detected, like you said, maybe when it's open. You yeah. Know, yeah. yeah. Closed, yeah. It, it shuts off. It's like a switch, you know, you turn it on. The light comes on. Turn it off. The light goes off. You know, but there well, is some, there could be some like residual, like maybe magnetic or electrical leftover to interfere slightly. But then you mm. get the strong mm. interference when that thing's open. Hmm. You know, yeah. So it, yeah, not, it wouldn't that's... really be a decay rate. It'd be like maybe leftover energy or something. Right, right. That's, I mean, that's that's exactly what. Exactly that's what I'm another about. theory. How many times do you want to drive through that intersection, though, <laughs> before your hair falls out? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm just slowly giving myself cancer every time I go through this intersection. Yeah, um, I love my car would my car would fail for good. Yeah, yeah. Boom. Oh, well, totally. Every, yo, cars nowadays, everything's all computerized. You know, it's just it. You know, you don't want to mess with driving through those things and then all of a sudden i've got a five thousand dollar car bill it oh yeah you know, you're in my car. shortage right now too you can't just like replace that stuff oh, like yeah. no. if, if if you fry a, a like a microchip in your car or something it's good luck get like you'll get on the waiting list so oh, yeah. shit. 
I had to wait. I had to wait six weeks just for the video card that got put in this custom built computer that I had custom built for me. I believe it. And that yeah, was it's wild, like right uh, six months ago, and it was like a six week wait just on the video card alone. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's it's absolutely nuts. So, but uh, I mean, we'll, yeah. you know, as as far as actually investigating that area, we're not too far from there. So, you know, I'll keep going back like oh, over and, and, and over again. Madison's a stone throw from where I got. Yeah, well, we actually like we moved uh, out of Madison. Now we're in uh, uh, Orfordville, the the village of, of Orfordville. It's uh, it's all of fourteen hundred people, so it's okay if 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 nobody's heard of it. Um, so, <laughs> so we got a 40, church and two bars. Yeah, we don't we don't even have a stoplight. I'm I'm really proud of that. There's no stoplights. <laughs> <in it. laughs> But, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're about 40 minutes south of Madison, like 20 minutes uh, north of the, the Illinois border. Um, wow. So, I mean, you know, we're closer to everything that, that we were working on anyway. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Oregon's not, it's still not far away from us. It's, I got the hell out of that in about six years. Ago. Yeah, it was the right time. You know, we were never going to be able to buy a house there anyway. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's what people do with yeah. It's just been getting worse. I didn't feel safe there anymore. No, I don't. I don't blame you. Uh, we lived yeah. um, on uh, just off Willie Street, and um, you know, I mean, I I was usually okay. It wasn't really very safe for Emily to be out by herself, um, which you know that sucks. Who wants I to live there? Last place I lived was I was about two blocks from Sanatorium Hill. Mm. Okay, oh, sure. Yeah, that that uh, yeah, it was pretty. Rough. Yeah, the neighborhoods back there um, have been kind of, you know, there's they've they they've they've had some issues for sure. Well, they've so. been destroying that city too. I mean, they took uh, one of the greatest events from that side of town and moved it. You know, I you mean, know it was a tradition to have what was it called? Now I used to know. Yeah, rhythm and booms. Thank you, Emily. Rhythm and booms. You know, they destroyed it. It was like a Madison tradition. Right. You know, I had a friend once from Iowa. She came up right around the time that, that rhythm and booms was going on, that, that one of the last years it was going on. And she's like, I have never, ever seen anything like this before. You know, but because people oh, yeah. complain, they had to move it and destroy it and take all of right. it. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 they moved it downtown, and it's not, I don't know. Like, we, we, we went there a couple times, I think. It was right there. Yeah, I mean, it was okay. But, no, it wasn't it, 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 it wasn't rhythm and booms, for sure. Yeah. Not so. That's the way it was. I used to work for, when they first started the rhythm and booms deal, I worked setting it up for a while. And then I worked security there. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I used, I grew up going to it. We used to go every, every single year. And then the last, the last shake the lake. I mean, we didn't even go downtown. We just watched it from like the park by, the our, park house, by our house, which was good because there was a shooting. So we didn't yeah. like, didn't have to be there for the, the, the shooting. So yeah, yeah that's, 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 that's the reason I got out of there, man. Oh, I don't get yeah. anywhere near that. So you ever been to Lee's farm? No, it's one of those things where like, well, like our, our, our friend Jay um, keeps telling Bay us, Hill. you know, you have to get out there. I know, I know you Bay have Hill called us. Finding Jay, Jay, right? What's You're that? You're talking about Jay Hill, Jay Hill from Finding Jay, right? Is that Jay? Oh, uh, Jay, or Jay Pichota Pichota or from, from, yeah. from Finding Jay. That's yeah. it. You get him. But uh, but yeah, I know he's been telling us to get out there. I I I, I know you um, and uh, Mark have been telling us to to get out there. Um, and I think finally, probably next year would be you know the mm -hmm. likely time. Um, well, because you know I was talking to uh, to Donna about it at the Beast to Bray Road conference, you know, and uh, and she said, hey, you know, like just just uh, uh, get a hold of him basically, and. Um, and I'm sure you can you can figure something out. So I'd like to get something set up probably for spring of, of 2022 to actually be able to get out there, stay overnight, you know, bring uh, uh, 
cameras and 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 all of Make our sure other weird and, camper. what's that Make sure you get a tent or an RV. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Like we'd probably just bring a tent, you know, something like that. But yeah, we we have plenty of camping equipment and and, and, and all that stuff. And good luck staying overnight there. The no, way. we tried that; it didn't work. No, well, what, in what, what way? Yeah, what? Um, what uh, we were there. We were there about two weekends before the the Sabre Road Conference. We had that scheduled ahead of time. It was myself, Mark, and uh, Dale Kazmarek um, from Illinois. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went there, oh, it was about 7 o'clock at night we started. We got to Lee's place. We took a tour, kind of got a preview of the hayride that he gave to everybody while they, you know, during that, that conference. And then... Um, we set up our equipment and everything was going good. You know, we, we had some hits on some of our equipment. Um, and at one point we were tracking a bipedal figure on the thermal and it was in a cornfield. So you couldn't see it, see it, but you could see it on the thermal because it was in the cornfield. Okay. <laughs> Dale and I lost it. We believed that it was following Mark because Mark was walking out in the hayfield part of it, and he swore something was following him. When he came back, he told us he swore something was following him in the hayfield or the cornfield. And shortly, about two or three hours after that, you know, we've got all our cameras set up on tripods out there, and everything's going just great. I've lived here in Wisconsin all my life. I have never, ever seen fog roll in so fast and so thick we had to quickly pack up all of our equipment because of this fog and the moisture that it was creating on the equipment. You know, worst thing that could happen to equipment. Sure. And by the time we got done packing it up and putting it in the cars, boom, about five, ten minutes later, the fog was gone. It just, it was like it was chasing us out of there. It was like trying to tell us to get the fuck out. You Interesting. Know? Huh. Why? Well, we got all of this on like four different four different devices of audio and stuff of you hearing, you know, Mark out there by himself saying, I, I swear something's following me in the cornfield. And then you hear Dale and I talking up on another audio device saying, we think it left and followed Mark because we lost track of it. Right. You know, and we can't be sure what it is because where Lee's farm is situated down there, you know, it could be what they call the beast of Bray road. It could have been a Bigfoot for all we know, because, you know, as far as Jay goes, um, it's been in that southern part of um, the Kettle Moraine Forest. Sighted oh, there. sure. We, I mean, we've, we've been out there with Jay tons of times. Right. And and that's just a, a, a short little jaunt down there to yeah, go down the East farm from the edge of the Kettle Moraine Forest there. Absolutely. So, and you look at his property... And seeing the things we've seen and heard the stories we heard from him, anything's possible. I mean, that place is loaded with a food source. The, the deer come down there in droves just to eat on the berries that are, that are just growing wild through there because you can see the deer track clearly all over. Oh, sure. Place, you know, and there's your Bigfoot or Beast of Bray Road food source right there, you know. And I don't know what it is, but he told us a story once about uh, he used to lay it, can't do it no more. He and Eric shut him down on this one. But he used to pick up the roadkill and, and put it out on his property. Well, he did that one time. Pretty good sized deer. Probably close to about 200 pounds. And it ended up wedged between two trees when he found it. Okay. How it got wedged there, I don't know. A wolf or something dragging it, there was no way that could have happened. Uh, a it mountain lion. Up and kind of, nope. We, 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 anything that would have had to use its jaws, whatever it had, had uh. to have arms, lift that sucker up and drop it into, or actually physically, because the way it was, it was like it was dropped from, you know, how trees grow, they get a little wider as they go upward sometimes oh, right you know it was like it was dropped in the wide part and just you know, 
Was it, I mean, so was it like, was it up high in, in this tree or was it just like between oh, two it was trees about on, waist on high where it was wedged? Okay. It was about waist high on me and I'm about six foot tall. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I think I was a little confused uh, uh, about its exact placement, but yeah, no, you're right. That's super weird. Cause of course, well, I mean, talking about finding a deer in a tree or something. And most people I think would in this area would think, Hey, a mountain lion, cause they'll drag prey up into a, into a tree to right. save it for the evidence of it being dragged and wedged like through the side wasn't there. Yeah. It had to be lifted above where it was and dropped right. Yeah, that's weird. I don't know. I don't know how to explain that. You know, uh, yeah, it's it's yeah. unexplained. We can't explain it. And, you know, living here in Wisconsin, we know the, I know most of all the, you know, local wildlife. And right. I don't believe any of it could have done what we saw. You know. No, I mean, yeah, that, that sounds an awful lot like deliberate placement for some reason. Um, it doesn't even really make sense from... Uh, a biological standpoint um because there's no advantage to putting a, a deer there so if you're a wild animal or something um because you know a, 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 again like the whole point of a mountain lion dragging its prey way up into a tree is so nothing else is going to get at it you know right. um and keeping it that low to the ground that's not going to like keep anybody away from it um so yeah no that just doesn't it doesn't make sense it seems like a, uh, somebody had to put it there on on purpose um, for what I mean, maybe it was like the fog. Maybe you know, maybe it's just like supposed to to freak you out. Who knows? Just like a hey, I'm here, and I want you to know that I'm here. Right, right. I mean, it, I mean, it was like it was taken from like the center of the hayfield over to the tree line and then wedged. Right. You know, it's just, it's just you know I always crazy. think like the Bigfoot are checking us out when they do something like that. Like they're watching us because they know we're going to stop there and try to figure it out. And then they can kind of gauge what we're doing. I could see that, you know, I mean, we've definitely like had that. Up. yeah, oh, definitely. I mean, we, like, we've had that experience of being, uh, watched, uh yeah, observed. watched, uh, yeah, totally. Like mm -hmm. when, when we're out in the, the, the Kettle Moraine, um, state forest, you know, so yeah, it definitely feels like there is an element of like observation involved with your interaction with whatever these things are. Right. So. And Jay, I don't we think the people him, that always has like a routine, sorry, of like putting his arms up being like, guys, it's just me, you know, uh, I'm not armed or anything. Not I think you're, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, I don't believe a lot of those people when they say they've had those kind of sightings and they were attacked, you know, because I don't believe Bigfoot's aggressive unless you do something to it first. You know? Yeah, I mean, like the, the only credible sightings that I've really heard of that involve like anything even close to like in, in, in attack would be, you know, sometimes you'll get people talking about uh, like like uh, 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 Steve Kruger. Right. So yeah. like when that 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 bear wolf thing that he described grab that deer out of, out of the back of his truck like that's the about the closest i think we get in or, in credible sightings at least you know in in this area to you know, rock, that, yeah. some kind of attack you know? but you know, yeah i mean yeah. like people i don't know i've never heard of anybody in wisconsin being like attacked by no. a, a big no, foot i, or, I mean I, you know, maybe I they don't leave survivors <laughs> I can see throwing the rocks or throwing the branches. It's like sure. their way of saying, hey, you're getting too yeah. close. Get the hell out of here. You right. Know, it's any man feels nervous, though, you know? Right. Well, and to Tom's point, you know, yeah, if, if they don't, if there's a 100% kill rate or, or something where people <laughs> just vanish, you know, I mean, that's a f fairly popular explanation. Um, that's for the missing 411, right? Yeah. Right. So you get into like, uh, oh, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, David Polites and like the missing 411 and all the national parks disappearances and stuff. And, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, like it's a popular explanation for it. I mean, the one thing that we're missing is proof, you know, obviously. So, I mean, you could just as easily say that those people were, I don't know, abducted by aliens and taken to Venus. I mean, we just have no idea, right. If, if, if they're missing. Um, you know, and then when, when people are found, it is often, uh, in, in weird circumstances. So, you know, you find their, their clothes have been taken off and they're, 
some distance away or, or you find the, the body in, in an area that, you, you know, you wouldn't think would be accessible to somebody like they really had to work hard to get there. Um, and that stuff's all really, really weird. You know, I'm not going to say that, that, that it isn't, um, you know, I just based on the other reports we have, like, for instance, if, if, uh, let's say that we're assuming Bigfoot is in, in animal right now, an animal that's aggressive is going to be aggressive. Well, uh, often a, a lot of the time. So if, 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 this, if, 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 if these things are out there killing people, there should be these instances of like really aggressive behavior or, or, you know, close calls. Like you should have some people who were just injured or, or almost injured or something who just barely got away. And, and, and maybe there, there are some that I just don't know about, honestly, because I don't know everything. Right. But, uh, but yeah, I, I haven't seen it around here, you know, not, at, not, not at all. I like to think Bigfoot is just too good of a killing machine to let anyone get away. <laughs> it made for a good movie. I would watch that movie. So sure. You know, it probably already exists. I'm going to just Google Bigfoot horror movies after this. You need the man who killed Hitler and then Bigfoot. That's who. That's the movie. I've heard that's that's good. good. There are a few guys out there. Sam Elliott. It's great. They killed Bigfoot or shot him, but then somewhere along the line, the body or the carcass disappeared. Oh, of course. Uh, You know, actually, that that uh, that reminds me. A friend of ours, uh, Aubrey, uh, he's in a paranormal investigator down in Georgia, and he interviewed a witness. And I got to listen to the the actual like uh, recorded interview of, of this. Um, he talked to this, this woman down there who said that she was on this camping trip um, near, oh boy, what was it? Kind of really ominous name. He was like, yeah, it was, it was like literally like blood like... mountain, which is an actual mountain. Like in, right. in uh, it's, it's on the uh, Appalachian trail there. Um, and so, you know, they're camping near, near blood mountain. And uh, she said that uh, she and her friends uh, saw this thing, this, you know, hairy humanoid, this huge uh, a humanoid thing. And uh, they were out in, in, in Appalachia. So like they were armed, which makes sense. I probably would be too. And, uh, and they said they started shooting at it, which that, that part didn't, yeah, that part didn't really make a lot of sense to me because it wasn't really doing anything, but they said that they started shooting at it. Um, and, uh, and they said that they found some blood and stuff, but whatever it was must have, have got away. So, yeah, I mean, I, people definitely say, you know, that they've, they've shot Bigfoot, uh, hit Bigfoot. Um, yeah. You but, know how cool that would be yeah. to have a Bigfoot head on your wall. That is like a conversation starter. <laughs> it, it, right. Well, it's a little morbid though. I mean, you know, part of it would just be like, if, I got my know, big buck. I got Bigfoot. I got, I guess it feels like if you just had like grandpa stuffed and put on the couch though, you know, like, cause they, they could be intelligent, you know, Mm -hmm. like they seem in a lot of ways to be sapient. And so um, I'm not an advocate for people trying to, to hurt Bigfoot. Like it just, no, Oklahoma's got a $3 million bounty on them. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that, that, that's, that's the, the uh, thing, you know, like people, well, the, the, the other argument, of course, there is that like, you know, people say, well, we have to kill one to get scientific proof. And then if we have scientific proof, then, you know, we can protect them. And I, my argument for that is, well, look, do they need to be protected? Because we don't have a body right now. So they seem to be doing OK. If right. they needed to be protected from us, like the bodies would be piling up, you know, yeah. but they're not. So I think big no, I, I can them up. I'll translate that argument. We need a body so people stop calling us nerds. Yeah. I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. They just care way too much what mainstream science thinks about their hobby. It's like, no, it's like, it's, it's just fine. Like enjoy hunting Bigfoot. You don't, you don't have to prove anything to anybody. Yeah. I went through that when I went to medical school, I would ask uh, some professors about ghosts and they would all tell me, don't ever say this, but yes. And then they all have their ghost stories. But since science is so against it, if they'd ever found out that they're getting like these people who believe in ghosts are getting grants to do research, it would like ruin their career just by co- going on record saying they believe in ghosts. It's insane. Oh, it is. Like it's 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 a huge shame. Um, like there are still 
some accredited people, you know, out there doing like parapsychological research. Um, well, like, I, I don't know if, if you guys saw the, uh, the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies, like just gave out their um, awards for um, the, like they, they, they had this contest basically where they were like, hey, if you're a professional in this field, um, you know, we want to see the best evidence that people have for like any kind of afterlife. Is that so the guy get, who you know, owns Skinwalker Ranch? He did. I, I think he sold it. But yeah, yeah, like, okay. like Robert uh, Bigelow. Yeah, Robert, Robert Bigelow, yeah, the, the billionaire who's super interested in, in UFOs. Yeah, well, not he's also Bam Bam Bigelow, in, the wrestler yeah, who does the not Bam wheels. Bam Bigelow, yeah. <laughs> uh, that would be awesome, though. Like, that would, that would we need more pro like professional wrestlers in the paranormal, I think. Like, here's a couple. <laughs> But we could use more. It we'll would, get Papa would... Shango. We'll call the Undertaker. We'll get Paul yeah, Bear out of the group. Start. The Undertaker. Yeah, I mean, like that's that's very thematic. That just makes sense. But uh, but, but but anyway, like, like they they had this contest, and yeah, it was a bunch of like uh, uh, accredited, uh, you know, scientists like doctors and, and PhDs and stuff uh, who won all all the top prizes, and so like and they're attached to major like universities and stuff. And so, you know, it was pretty, I thought it was really cool. Uh, you know, it was, it was very heartening to me to see like, you know, that there is uh, a para, uh, parapsychology being performed by scientists still, you know, I think a lot of people just assume that that died off in, in the early 20th century or, or mid century at the latest, but no, yeah. people are still well, out there doing it. Ask Joe about their award winning podcast. <laughs> Even mainstream media, what'd you get it for? Best oh, non they, they called they categorized us as sci fi. Yeah. As a sci fi podcast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sure they didn't have a category that actually fit. Well, so they could have no, they made that category and put us in it. Yeah, that's oh, the they category they made put them in. One it's like a double category or kicks to know. the balls with both feet. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, that almost feels like, you know, when, when you were a kid and like, you know, like your, your grandma's trying to figure out what you're into, like, she's really trying hard to understand your hobbies, but she can never quite get there. And so, yeah. you know, like yeah. you're into, like, you're super into Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And so, you know, like she gets you like a, a stuffed turtle or something and you're like, oh, grandma, you were so close. So yeah. that's kind of like like mainstream society trying to understand right. what this podcast is about. Yeah. They're like, is it sci-fi? I don't know. Yeah. yeah, my grandma would give me a Go Sports shirt. <laughs> Go Sports. My favorite team is sports. So like that that works out great. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that's Where do they put your book in the library section? I great question. Um, I, think I am libraries have it. Some might. Oh, I some of them do for sure because we've seen some ordered. I'm going to guess that it's probably firmly in the speculative nonfiction section. Um, because that's where back when I used to go to the, the library all, all, all the time to, to get my books, um, like pre internet, now I just can order all my books, but um. Most of what I was looking for would be in like speculative nonfiction or, or something similar. Um, I think they like sometimes they would have like a dedicated occult section, which was cool. Sometimes it, there literally is an unexplained yeah. section. Sure. Yeah, I that so I, probably. Yeah, something I, like that. I saw like an unexplained category or section at a library. I think it was in Racine. Um, I went to saw Chad Lewis there do a talk. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at your books on Amazon, but they don't really. It also says books I may like: UFO, Jesus, and Psychic Witch. <laughs> you might like those books. I don't know. Uh, the, the 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 guy who wrote Psychic Witch seems super nice. I don't really know him, but I've seen him on Twitter. Um, oh, really? Cool. So yeah, I don't know. Like, go well, because the weird thing about Amazon is like they don't use like you know. The, the same library categorization system. So I think like the books are probably filed under like unexplained and slash UFOs unexplained or something. Oh, it's, it's category for whatever reason. Yeah. So it's 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 something like that. Okay. Strange Tales is unexplained mysteries. 
Uh, and the <laughs> Ma- Michigan monster is labeled in occult UFOs, UFOs, and UFOs. <laughs> okay. Well, there you that have it. That's not what I registered it under, but I, I feel like it gets put in lists. They do their own categorization, I'm sure. Yep. Based so on it's UFOs. I think some of it's got to do with because they do audio books as well. Hmm. You know. I could see that. You know. Well, I mean, in a way, the Lake Michigan Mothman, like it's unidentified and it's often flying. So yeah, sure, you it is a UFO. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, I guess. What's technical they... about it, it is a UFO, unidentified yeah, flying no. object. That's what I saw. That I did, mean, did, I did anyone else notice that. not the wings flapping? It was like a kid was holding it and going like flying an action figure. Yeah, I mean, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just, I, I've heard that from cases we've had too. Yeah, I mean, definitely a lot of people, um, sometimes people will report it taking off and it not flapping its wings, but sometimes people will report it flapping its wings uh, while taking off. In flight, um, it's almost unheard of for anybody to uh, report this thing flapping its 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 wings at all. No, um, okay. So, like, once it's in, in, in the air, like, it doesn't seem to flap. Yeah, it just kind of has them out, and then it's, it's you know, gliding or, or, or flying around. Um, so, yeah, and which is weird. Now, and I think that speaks to, like, a, a really interesting aspect to this phenomenon, too, which is sort of the, the, the seeming biological impossibility of this thing to even exist as it does. You know, so if, if you think about like a seven or eight foot tall. I mean, even like something my size, I'm six two. And if I were to need, like, if, if, if I were to get off the ground, I would need like 30 foot wings. You know what I mean? Like they would have yeah. to be huge. Yeah. And people report this creature bigger than me somehow flying with, you know, 15 foot wings. Like it That's just nothing. No, yeah. it, they shouldn't be able to fly. It doesn't make right. sense. And yet here we are. Here, isn't that kind of I got like another that? argument for you on that one, though. Sure. You got to take in most of these pictures that I've seen of, like, Mothman. They, they're not, like, beefy like you and me. They're, like, skin and bones. So they're not going to weigh probably the same you pluck weight. a bird, though, they look like nothing. <laughs> well, they're hollow bones. and Yeah. So Sure. You know, I mean, maybe. The weight's going to be a lot different. I don't know. And then another thing that stuck out was the eyes were like a color. The closest thing that I've ever seen was the reflectors on a bike when they get that like shiny ruby red. Yeah. Yeah. When the light hits the eye color. So was it like eye shine? They weren't shining out. It was just looking into redness of that. Weird. Well, like you know, because like you've you've probably had the experience of you know, uh, literally seeing like a deer in your headlights or something at some point. And was I know it, that as a hunt. No, deer like even I, I've shined enough deer to know that you know the does have the green eyes, the bucks have the orange eyes. So get excited when yeah. you see the orange eyes and what that's <laughs> like. These were like almost like lit like a jack o' lantern when you look at it that mm-hmm. way. If okay. that makes sense. They're illuminating, not reflecting. Yeah. yeah. So it's like creating its own light, which is also weird yeah. because if your eyes created light, you should just be blind, you know, because that's not how dark, I right? it's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. So and I'm not there saying no that to say that like these things couldn't exist. I'm saying that these things seem to exist because people keep seeing them, but for some bizarre reason, they're seemingly impossible. So people are awesome creatures you know which what what does that mean you know like are we dealing with something that um basically sort of works on principles outside of what we think is possible and even the terminator knew to put sunglasses on to cover his red eye (laughs) right (laughs) i you know now i'm picturing mothman in in sunglasses and that you know I'm going to need that on a t-shirt or something. <laughs> Cover his red eyes. <laughs> right. Well, so what did what you figure out with Lake Michigan Mothman? Is it one? Is it what? What, what I see? 
Oh, I don't know. I mean, like I, uh, I could lie to you and, and tell you that I, I, I know what it is, but I, you know, I, I don't. And frankly, nobody I does. I um, personally think it's more than one. I, 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 I would agree. I, I think like it's that also much. I believe just cause like it feel, it doesn't feel like, Oh, this, it doesn't feel like Santa Claus, you know, like this one guy going around everywhere. It feels like there's different ones of it. And right. like, with some of those sightings too close to each other, too far apart from distance. So, you know. Well, you got yeah, me I mean, thinking the, the, the on are... mm-hmm. you, you really got me thinking something of, do you think this could be some sort of alien spacesuit with the inside of a helmet looking red, maybe? Jetpacking I mean, around? Maybe. Um, it's, it's an interesting idea. Now, certainly a lot of these sightings take place in, in, you know, the same geographic area as UFO sightings. Um, although, you know, that, that presupposes that we know what, what UFOs are, for instance, Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we we really don't, maybe they're extraterrestrial craft. Uh, maybe they're, they're something else in entirely, which they very well could be. Um, you know, what's, uh, what's interesting about these sightings, I mean, like Joe said, like they are spread out over this huge geographic area, like all around Lake Michigan. It's not just Chicago. People like to focus on Chicago, but it's, it's not just, just, uh, uh Chicago. Um, and, you know, beyond that, you know, like Emily said, I, I do think that, uh, we're dealing with multiple creatures. There are some, uh, differences in in the the description, like nothing so much that would make me think that it's something else entirely, but enough where it seems individual. You know what I mean? So like people are seeing different like individuals of of whatever this is. Um, and then when you start to think about some of the the difficulties uh, in reconciling how this thing should work, if it's if if it's a true biological being. Um, you know, personally, at this point, I kind of land more on the, the more high strangeness side of it. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't know that what we're dealing with is something that we would conceive of as a, a, a traditional biological animal so much as, as some other kind of, of entity. Um, you know, and, and you could describe that in a variety of terms. You know, you could describe it as a spiritual entity or interdimensional or, or, or whatever you want. But But all I... No, at this point is, you know, based on on the uh, the accounts we have right now, it certainly seems to be something outside of our current understanding of biology and uh, and, and physics. So, yeah. I mean, that's I take that for for what it is, you know, it's, I personally uh, think it's like like you said, an interdimensional species, maybe something spiritual in the like a spiritual realm or. Those Actually, might be the same thing. Like you yeah, might literally that's be describing the same thing. Thing. And then, how they could be in one place, and then a couple hours later show up three, four hundred miles or three, four thousand miles away. You know, within a couple yeah. hours. I mean, the whole Mothman sighting. I mean, wasn't the earliest sighting um, um, Point Pleasant, West Virginia? The so earlier ones. That th- like those were earlier. Uh, that was like that particular flap. So if you're if you're sort of talking about the the Point Pleasant sightings as investigated by like you know John Keel and Gray Barker and and um, you know all all of them, um, uh, Mary Heyer, uh, um, that was sixty six to to sixty seven. Uh, there have been uh, cases that have been reported since then where the witnesses said that they took place before that flap. But I think that flap was probably the earliest uh, uh, sort of reported sightings um, uh, uh, as close to the time as, as when they actually happened. You know what I mean? So uh, like when people saw it in, in 66, they were reporting it like that same day or, or, or at, at least you know, relatively uh, recently in comparison to when they saw it. Um, and a, a lot of the stuff that uh, reportedly took place before that it has only been uh, reported relatively recently. So, um, you know, who knows, uh, you know, if, if, if it took place when, uh, when the, the witness said it did. Um, so yeah, no, to, to take a really long time answering that. Yeah. I mean, like some of the, the earliest uh, reported sightings definitely are, are, are point pleasant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then it gets shown up in Chicago, which is, you know, look at that thousands of miles away. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, after the... And if it is, 
maybe it is interdimensional and can travel, you know, that fast, that far of a distance, that fast, you know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we we I mean, witness more. Right. Well, I mean, I think you have to, like to, to keep an, an open mind for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had witnesses report, um, you know, uh, this thing just disappearing, basically, like while they're looking yeah. at it. Um, one, one guy told us that as he was staring at this thing, it just sort of blurred and then it was gone. gone. And then, yeah, yeah, it just disappeared. That sounds so. like a computer glitch in real life. Yeah, well, we're living in a simulation, right? Yeah. That's another so, thing, yeah. Matrix come to life. Yeah, right. That goes the Cartesian model all the way back. Uh, well, those are, you know, I, I saw, I haven't seen Mothman, but I have seen some pretty strange shit around the Madison <laughs> area in the last six years. Since, well, since Mark and I started doing this back in, I don't know, when did we change formats? 2019, we started doing all the investigating and stuff. But it also triggers some memories, too, as I'm sitting there getting into this. I used to travel back and forth to Madison a lot when I was a kid. And if you go down what we called as Old 14, which basically you just keep following Park Street out to yep. you know, South Park Street, and you just keep following it to Oregon. That's Old 14. That's so how you get to our house, actually. Actually, that's New 14. Old, well, either way. I can't remember. Anyway, you follow this area out. You get to the one exit for Oregon. Yes, yeah, so that's New 14. That you follow Park Street straight out. Mm -hmm. You get to the exit that actually goes on to Old 14, which ends up turning into Main Street, Oregon, basically. Right before that exit, there's like the Oregon, big Oregon wooden. I don't know if it's still there, but it says Oregon on it. And it's a big wooden type sign. It's, you know, off in a field, off the highway, off side of the road quite a bit and there's a couple other like big fog type deals up there like that you know it's down from the oak hill prison down the hill you know anyway i used to see turkey vultures sitting there a lot so i know what they look like but then i've also seen something that i couldn't figure out or identify that was all black and bigger than a turkey vulture. interesting you know and I've seen something just like that recently. And I knew, well, it was last summer. We were driving back um, to where I live now out here in Watertown, um, coming through the Cambridge area, kind of, because we've taken a kind of a detour. Um, one of those overpass signs, you know, the like you're driving down the Beltline, 12 and 18, you're going through to Cambridge and you get to the interstate area. You got the great big signs telling you what exits what great big green signs that are attached to those bridge well something was up there and it had a wingspan bigger than those That's signs true. you know and i'm talking That's about the big middle ones that say and stay in this lane for cambridge you know what's our sure. biggest birds in wisconsin we got cranes herons and maybe swans that come through not that big. Yeah, I mean, it would be something like a, a sandhill crane or maybe like a, a great blue heron, probably. So you're looking at like All a six five, to seven foot wingspan. How big are turkey vultures? This was at least an eight plus, eight plus, you know, eight plus yeah. foot wingspan, easy. Yeah, that's that's pretty wild. I mean, we've had we've had you know, uh, reports like from Madison. Actually, there was one. From just off the Beltline, which yeah. which was weird. Yeah, this um, is where I was, it's just on the Beltline. I was on the Beltline, right. sitting on one of those signs with the swings yeah. out like this, you know. Right, right. I like um, was sitting up there stretching. Yeah, no, oh, that's yeah. that's just bizarre. You know, because I I talked to uh, talked to a woman probably 2019. I would, I think it was like 2019. I uh, might have been, might have, no, it wasn't last year. I, I'm, I thought it was. Was it last year? Maybe. It was. I'm reasonably certain it was 2019. Maybe it was last year. It's not really relevant. And, um, and uh, she had said that when she was a little kid, she was with her mom. This would have been like early 2000s, and uh, and they saw something like that, or her mom saw it anyway, 
just off of the uh, the, the belt line. So they had taken the exit to uh, it's boy, it's that exit right kind Whitney of Way? no, it wasn't Whitney Way. It's kind of by the uh, the arboretum. Um, oh, Seminole Highway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Seminole Highway exit. Exactly. And yeah, and they saw this this thing like flying overhead, and it was you know kind of as 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 you described, and as a lot of witnesses described, frankly, like this big uh, black being. Uh, only they like like they saw the, the the glowing red eyes. Well, what's really weird about their sighting is that it didn't stop with that. It actually ended up being like this weird kind of haunting almost where. Uh, her mom said that she was in the, uh, the the basement of their apartment building at one point, and, and she saw it down there. Like she turned around, and it was there in the basement with her, um, sure. which is weird, you know. And you can't really e- explain oh, that. Like an cool. animal would do that. What's that? That sounds a little scary. I don't know if I want to be, yeah. able, you know, trapped in a basement with a creature like that. No, yeah, she didn't want to be trapped in a basement with a, a creature like that. Please so, tell me um, you're Batman. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Fingers crossed. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it was weird, and they they experienced all like all kinds of other like weird um, uh, phenomena that you would associate with a haunted house, sort of during this this time period too. So I think it was all very very strange, like certainly above and beyond like what you would um, expect out of just uh, the the sighting of a, a like some kind of animal, you know. So, right. Yeah. Very weird. Well, you know, I'm believing what I saw. I think you know, like I believe some of that stuff too. You know, where you know we assume just because we don't see it anymore and we can't find it anymore, something's extinct. Okay. Well, they've assumed that so many times, and as what was his name, Jeff Goldblum said in in jurassic park you know life finds a way it always does you know and who's to say that you know what i saw couldn't have been maybe some bird from the past or you know some kind of whatever you know you know because there was like condors and stuff like that that were huge or you know Mm -hmm or something that's not native and just got pushed this far and wasn't native to Wisconsin. And now we're starting to see this big, ugly thing. You know, I don't believe what I saw was Mothman. I was thinking more lines of, of uh, like a Thunderbird when I first saw it, you know? Mm-hmm. Sure. Well, I, I think that accounts for some of the, uh, certainly some of the, the Lake Michigan Mothman sightings. So, like for instance, there's there's two different basic sighting profiles that, that we put together for that particular investigation. You know, the the, the first one is basically misidentified birds, um, and there are a significant number of those. And then the other profile is for the potentially paranormal stuff that couldn't possibly be explained as uh, as misidentified birds. And and how we managed to get this profile together right is uh, thanks to this guy down in the Pilsen neighborhood of Chicago. This was May of 2018. So he's bicycling to work, right? And as he's he's biking to work, you know, he's wearing his bicycle helmet and on his helmet is a GoPro because he liked to wear a GoPro on his bicycle. And so like he's he's biking to work and he sees this couple on the street corner and they're looking at something up in the uh, sky. And so he looks up to see what, you know, what the hell they're looking at. And uh, he saw what he later described to me as either a giant bat or a man in a wingsuit. And since he's wearing the, and this is like the middle of the day, and so, like, since he's wearing this this GoPro, he's he decided he's going to follow this thing around, get as much footage of it as he can, and he did. And he, you know, I spoke to him over the the uh, phone. He was very, very forthright in terms of describing his experience. I don't think at any point he was lying. I think that he was trying his best to authentically relate his experience. He went so far as to send us the SD card from that GoPro cam- like camera. This guy had nothing to hide. It's risky business. Right. And so <laughs> like he like we we with his help managed to uh cuz again it's a go it's a GoPro camera so it sucked. Um and it was really really hard to find the 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 footage in there of this thing but with his help we were able to find it. We were able to isolate some good stills. We blew those up 
And what he had actually seen, according to the evidence in his camera, which I am apt to believe, was a bird. It was a huge bird, but it was a bird. And so what happens a lot of the time is people will see something that they've never seen before. Um, it could be a, just a bird that's bigger than anything that they've ever seen. And, uh, and they will describe that in a, a variety of ways. You know, it's all sort of dependent on people's perspective and how they interpret it. Um, but in the Lake Michigan Mothman investigation, you, you see a lot of these daytime sightings that sound, if you kind of strip away the, the witness narrative, they sound exactly like what this guy in Pilsen saw, which was definitely a bird. Right. And so with like using that evidence, you know, we were able to sort of create this profile of daytime sightings in the Lake Michigan Mothman investigation that are almost certainly misidentified birds. Now, that isn't to say that, that they are all misidentified birds, but some of them almost definitely are. Um, and really what that allowed us to do, because up until then I was kind of struggling. I was like, why do some people see this thing during the day and some people see it at night? Why do, why do some people like describe this feeling of stark terror and glowing red eyes and other people just see a thing kind of winging around, you know, on, on their noon lunch break. Right. Um, and so once we had that Pilsen footage, I think we were really able to kind of create this profile and be like, Hey, these daytime sightings, that seem totally separate from these other, like other sightings are totally separate from these other sightings because they're probably just birds. And when you dig a little deeper into that, you can see that, you know, due to things like climate change and the, the destruction of their, their wetland habitat, uh, bird, like big birds, like herons have been roosting in Chicago uh, a lot more than, than they, they used to. They've been coming North earlier and staying longer, sometimes even overwintering. You know, mm -hmm. like I found uh, like all kinds of like large uh, ambulatory bird tracks in the snow, which is weird, you know, but if there's open water, they will, they'll, they'll stay now. Uh, anyway, all of that aside is really just, just uh, to, to say that, um, yeah, no, definitely. Some, some people are seeing birds, um, you know, they, maybe some of them are, are great blue herons. They're huge. They kind of look like a person or a pterodactyl or something. If you see them flying, um, yeah, and maybe yeah. some of them are something weirder, maybe something, uh, 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 like some of them are something like, you know, what people would describe as, as a thunderbird, like some kind of, of unexplained avian species. Um, but yeah, no, some of them are definitely birds. Like I said, I, I'm pretty sure what I saw was some kind of bird, but I don't think it was native to Wisconsin to begin with. Or it was like maybe some long extinct type thing because this thing was huge. I mean, massively huge, but it was all bird. Easily, you know. Sure. But that's like the Beast of Bray Road. You can take that same theory to Beast of Bray Road. You know, if you've ever been down Bray Road, and there's many of these in Wisconsin, like Bray Road. It's long, dark, no street lights. You know, if you got a nice clear sky and a full moon, you get a little bit of light to go along with your headlights, right? Mm -hmm. You're driving down this road late at night, and you see a wolf or, or a coyote or, or something eating a deer, a roadkill. <laughs> Here's you coming, and it kind of does that, you know kind of stretch up and look like this, you know, kind of do that thing that we'll do to look at you. Your mind's going to play tricks at you if you're down there at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night by yourself driving down that long road, you know. And then you're going to miss it by a wolf as a beast of Bray Road. You know? I mean, you just described every road by us. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I totally get it, you know, like – and you're not wrong. I mean, if it's a real quick sighting, you know, like they, not everybody stops the car or anything to get out and check on it. Um, that yeah. That would be my instinct. Right. I mean, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. People can, can misidentify stuff like that is, that is a known, but, uh, uh I'm not, you know, I'm not closed minded enough to say that, well, it could be even a dire wolf, you know, which supposedly hmm. went extinct a long time ago. But then there is uh, recent YouTube footage of a uh, pretty good YouTube footage that I've seen of what they believed was a dire wolf in this. I remember that video. Yeah. 
Trick. So is that know. the one chasing the dog around? Yeah. The dog? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that big black tire wolf. Yeah. Thing huge. That was crazy. Thing massive. All right. Now, I own, you, you haven't been to my place yet, Tom, but I own a purebred Siberian Husky. All right. It's the second one I've had. The first one, he un unfortunately passed away about two years after I moved out here, but he was he was a little on the old side. Um, but everybody thought he was a wolf right away. They thought that I had a wolf for a pet because he looked so massive. All right. And I'm thinking, you know, you take my dog and you almost double it. That's a wolf. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, a Siberian Husky gets to be about 70, 75 pounds, 80 if it's a male. Okay. Wolves, you're talking 150, 200 plus pounds in some cases. Oh, yeah. It's about twice the size of my dog. You know, so, and I can easily see how the mind would play tricks of you, Anya, if you saw my dog or a wolf or something eating roadkill. You know, and you just drove by quick, you know, midnight, you're by yourself, and it's all dark, you know, mine's going to play tricks with you real quick. But sure. it's not to say that there's not something going on out there. Because after I met Lee Hample and, and I went out to his farm and all of that, we got a lot more than what we bargained for. You oh, know. definitely. I mean, the, the, the other thing I, I wanted to add on to that, too, is it, we don't get enough wolves down here where it, people are really used to seeing them anyway. So I mostly up north, mid, middle yeah, of the state. I mean, like, and, 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 you know, and I'm sure you guys know that. I'm just saying, like, if I, most people, if they saw a wolf, you know, walking around down here, they, they would have never seen one out, like, outside of a zoo before, even right. though they do range down here. It's just mm -hmm. not common enough. It's where, not where common people, yet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think that just increases the probability of somebody misidentifying it, you know, and, and sort of like exaggerating it in their mind because they're seeing this thing that they've never seen before. And it's going to look weird and scary. It's going to look freaky because right. they're enormous. And then just because wolves all right, you here in Wisconsin, they're, they're either called one of two things. They're either called a timber wolf or a gray wolf. It's basically the same wolf. It just depends on where you are in the world, what you call it. Okay, now they can be any color, just like a normal canine. You know, I mean, you see one of those that's like pure black. Yeah, you know. Oh, it's, it's gonna be freaky. You know, you know like, and I don't see them around here, but we do have a family of coyotes that moved in around my community within the last year or so. There's a so lot of coyotes around here, around this way. You know. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I there are a careful lot of my dog out at night because she'll attack the coyotes. Yeah, that's not safe. You know, um, Siberian Huskies were bred to not not so much as people commonly think of them as a sled dog. Hmm. You know, the Siberian Husky in a sled dog is your lead dog because they're the smartest of all the breeds. Okay, it's the Malamutes. That, uh, that make up most of a sled team because they're the strength. They got the most strength. But both breeds can run forever. They've got a s unbelievable stamina. Right. But the, the, the Siberian Huskies were bred to basically protect cattle and, and other things from coyote. You know, because they would it's like their natural enemy or something. They will kill a coyote or a wolf if it gets close to their property. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's just real dangerous, you know, because a pack, of, I, I don't, I would hate to see a dog, you know, against a pack of coyotes, regardless of the, the, the dog. Well, coyotes aren't pack dogs. But what? Wolves are though. Wolves mm. and huskies are pack dogs. No, coyotes you're right. They go out on their own more. Coyotes are more like scavengers. They'll go right, right. It's more like a fox, stuff. too, right? Yeah. Uh, it's more like a fox. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The coyotes are 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 like the scavenger type. They're 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 they they won't hunt unless they absolutely have to. You know. Sure. And you know, a wolf will hunt. And the scary thing about the wolves are is that they're just as smart as my husky out here 
And the thing is, you run into one wolf, you better be careful because you're surrounded already. Right. You just don't know it yet. You know, they've got you surrounded. That's what a pack dog will do. They'll, they'll, they'll have one come out, and scout you out, check you out, while the other's got you surrounded. You make the wrong move, you're up against the pack. You're done. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, I you're right about about coyotes. Now, I'm not a biologist. I don't know a ton about I it. I just know a lot. But of yeah, no, they, they are scavengers and stuff. I always thought that they had like family groups and stuff, but I guess I didn't really. I never they really do. stopped to think about it. They don't always travel as close knit as as a wolf pack would. Sure. You know, okay. They don't. They're not like um like like I said. You know. Uh, a wolf you you run into one lonely wolf in the in the in the woods or something like that it's not alone you're surrounded you right, know right. it's not going to be that way with coyotes they don't have that type of uh i don't know they don't do that kind of you know there's not organized of, in, in in that way yeah, they're not as organized sure. that's it that's a good way to put it they're not as organized yeah. as like a wolf pack would be you know the yeah, coyotes no, that's, that's, that's totally fair yeah, no. absolutely. And but there are a ton of coyotes down here. I mean, we hear oh, them. Yeah, they're all over the place. Every Basically. time we go out, yeah, it's like you just you hear them howling. You mm -hmm. know, I, I used to go to my dad. I used to, my dad lived in McFarland, and I used to watch his place when he'd leave town for whatever purpose. And I'd drive cab, so I'd get off at two, three o'clock in the morning, and I'd be driving, you know, out to his place out in the middle of the country part of McFarland, and I'd see him all over the place. Hell, I saw him. I saw a couple of them in the driveway as I pulled in, and it's like, motherfuckers, move! Right. You know, so I can open the garage and get in safely. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, coyotes probably not going to mess with a, a full-grown no, human, but car coming, they took off like a bat out of hell. Yeah. I just, I would just worry about our pets. You know, like mm -hmm. our our smallest dog, she's only like thirty pounds, probably. You know, yeah. and like I, I would, I would hate to see that fight. Um, you know, just because I don't want my dog to get hurt. But yeah, I mean, yeah. if you're not, if I've you're not a small dog, dog I, I saw a dog that size, you know, like a little lap dog size, you know, 10, 20 pounds. I don't know. Just hmm. kind of thing, you know, I saw one of those ones. I was up at a, uh, what was it called? Pelican Lake here in Wisconsin. Sounds familiar. It does sound familiar. All right. It, it's up past Westfield a little ways. I went up there one time and it was like, Early in the morning, I'm sitting there eating breakfast, and this guy decides to let his dog out. And his wife starts yelling at him, don't be doing that. You know what happened last time you let the dog out without a leash, right? So he goes out there, and he's got the dog on the leash, and he's out at the end of the pier on Pelican Lake. Right and early in the morning, the sun's just coming up. All of a sudden, an ego come down and tried to grab the dog from him. Oh, yeah. No, that'll totally happen. I've yeah. never seen anything like that before. And it was just That's like, wild. and then the next thing you know, when he grabs the dog and, you know, gets it back in the house safely, the next thing you know, one hell of a spectacle starts to happen. These eagles just, and it was a whole bunch of them. They were just boom, swooping down into that lake and coming up and out with fish in their talons. Wow. You know? And he says, it happens every morning. Summer. That doesn't surprise me. You know, one of the things I noticed when we moved out here is, you know, living in Madison, there's so many rabbits. There's just rabbits everywhere. And then we moved out here and I've seen like two rabbits in the, the, the six months we lived here. And I used to see like five or six rabbits every single day. What I do see a lot of, though, I see a bunch of hawks, a bunch yeah. of real big hawks. That are just all you don't that see a whole lot of rabbits. Rabbit. I'm like, well, that explains why I'm not seeing so many rabbits. Okay, that's <laughs> that 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 makes sense. Well, yeah. yeah, I've seen. I, I I noticed that too. I got out here. I live out in Watertown, out in the country part of it, and yeah, we've got some. We got a few hawks around here, and I haven't seen very many rabbits, and I haven't seen in the six years I've lived here in this community. And there's there's a kind of a big lake in my backyard, kind of on the other okay. side of the street here. I haven't seen one squirrel. Not one. Right? We, I never see squirrels. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're all hawk food. Seriously. Like, it, it's so weird. 
well, hawks or owls. We've got those. Yeah, here. Or, or owls, for owls. sure. So, yeah, yeah, those birds of prey, they're quick and they're precise. Oh, yeah, I definitely hear owls. I don't see owls as often as I see hawks, but, you yeah. know. You don't see the owls as often as you hear them. I hear them both. There's right. like two of them here native to Wisconsin, or more than two, but two that I know of that are native to Wisconsin. One will sit there and be vocal at night, and the other one's vocal early in the morning. You know. Hmm. But I don't hear them anymore. It well, and it's important to know stuff like that. You know, honestly, for oh. anybody out there listening, like, if you're wondering why we're all so interested in, like, animals and animal behavior, um, is because when you're out in the field, you ha- you got to know that stuff. you got to be yeah, able to you recognize know that stuff. It's, it's, one, it's for safety, for your, right. own, your own safety. If you're out in, in the woods somewhere, you got to know what you could possibly run into. and. Sure. How to protect yourself and second it helps with you know the misidentifications you that's know. exactly right yeah a- yeah the closer absolutely. you get to nature the more the better an investigator you're gonna be because like i mean just even i think you know before i really got into it this with tobias um you know i probably just considered like Bigfoot and any cryptid as an um, uh, non-discovered organism. And the more I've gotten closer to nature and been out in nature, the more I'm like, well, that makes no sense. You know, because the more you understand the natural world, the weirder stuff makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it can be difficult to sort of try to fit Bigfoot um, or especially stuff like Dogman uh, or Mothman or something like that sort of into the natural order. Mm-hmm. Um, it just yeah. Now Bigfoot, that's the one a lot of people, you know, like I, they, they are really set and I get this as, as uh, Bigfoot as in, 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 in undiscovered primate. Um, yeah, and, uh, uh, and I wouldn't write that off. They think it's a descendant of that. Uh, what was it called? A ring up, a ring up something. Ring, uh, uh, it was like a, a prehistoric Gigantopithecus, yeah, that's it. Oh, that one, okay, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah, I, 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 I heard that, and yeah, I mean, people, I that. I've heard that theory, yeah, but I don't buy that either, yeah, and the, yeah, right. I mean, like, there are a lot of adherence to that, and, and some of our friends, you know, um, like mm-hmm. I, I, I know just from talking to them, like Seth, uh. Uh, you know, Seth Breedlove from Small Town Monsters, um, right. you know, like he's still, he's getting more on board with high strangeness, I think, although I won't speak for him. Um, but when it comes to Bigfoot, you know, he's always been a uh, sort of uh, a, a staunch uh, naturalist. That is to say, viewing Bigfoot as uh, in, in undiscovered uh, species, you know, and uh, and I get why. I mean, I think that's one where uh, in the right area, you know, with uh, the, the right food sources and stuff um, and the right level of intelligence, you know, it has to be sapient for any of this to make sense. Um, then, yeah, okay, sure, maybe, you know, because it, it, it could at least exist because we know things like it have existed like on the planet at other times. Um, but you get into the other stuff and yeah, the more you learn about the, the natural world, the less sense any of it makes, um, and which is why, you know, I tend to lean towards the weirder explanations uh, just because, you know, what was it, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle that said, you know, once you've, um, what, like, just dis- like uh, uh, discarded all of the, like, impossible, whatever's left, you know. That was Spock. The, the solution. Was it Spock? I don't know. That somebody. was Spock. I butchered the, I I butchered the quote <laughs> anyway. I don't even know. That's okay. Uh, Less. But you know what? Maybe the natural world that we're used to or comfortable with is not what we think it is. And this stuff does make sure. sense somewhere. Yeah, well, I think it has to make sense somewhere. And that's a really good point. Um, because I don't think that there are things that can't be understood scientifically. I just happen to think that it's likely that our understanding or our or I should say our scientific understanding of the world or the universe isn't up to the task of understanding these things yet. I don't know that we have the technology to properly record them. Um, I don't know that we have the the models 
even um, to, to, to even begin to understand or explain their existence. And so we are sort of left in this, this speculative phase. But yeah, I think eventually, given time, um, it's, uh, it's something that, that could be understood in, in scientific terms because science is, you know, it's just a way of looking at the world, right? It's not, it, oh. there shouldn't be any dogma attached. So. Um, I personally think too that like if we're talking about undiscovered organisms like I could see like lake monsters and like anything in a body of water being very difficult to find simply because we I've heard I think I forgot who said it but somebody said that we know more about like the sur surface of the moon than our own oceans right so I think if something were to exist and hide it would be Underwater. Yeah, no, I can see that. A lot of people uh, see UFOs coming in and out of water, which has always been interesting to me. Well, I can see, a, you know, considering the, the, the sightings all over, the shipwrecks and the, the unexplained just water phenomenon that's happened, that's been recorded, you know, you can't say that we don't, I don't think we even have the technology to discover anything that's deep enough down there yet. You know, mm -hmm. who knows how many caverns or caves there could be and where they could lead to and what could be behind there. I still believe that Megalodon could still exist. You know, I mean, who's to say that it doesn't go down to the depths where we can't reach? We don't have that kind of technology. You know, things sure. are going to hold that far down. You know, cameras, you know, probably aren't good enough to, to get, you know, it gets so dark down there. You know, you see the documentaries, light. it gets so dark down there that the life forms have to create their own light. Well, you yeah, know? not to mention the, it's just like the amount of pressure mm -hmm. that, yeah. you know, that is, you get right. it, that it would, like that. Yeah, it would implode those cameras. You know, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I would buy that uh, for sure. And then, you know, also, you know, when you're, you're sort of thinking about some of the weirder behaviors that people report uh, from different, you know, cryptids, you know, be it Mothman or, or Dogman or whatever, you know, sort of the like uh, sudden disappearances, um, some of the like uh, uh, associated weird phenomena, like sort of the, the haunting type phenomena, UFOs in the, 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 the same area, um, as these other monster sightings, you know, it, it, it does all seem connected in some way. And it does sort of speak to me um, to, you know, as, as, as some, just something that exists outside of our current understanding of the, 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 the universe, you know, um, you know, for instance, like, let's say that we do have something coming here from a, a parallel universe or something using some means that is completely outside of our understanding, you know, hopping through portals or something we don't have anything to measure that we can't predict it we can't reproduce it in a lab how would you even begin to study it you know it would be like uh the anthill on our sidewalk outside trying to study us you know they would have about as good of a chance so what do you do in that situation you know you do the only thing you can do which is what we're doing um and hopefully you know i think that we're seeing some of the, the greatest minds on our planet starting to take this stuff seriously and, uh, and, and coming up with theoretical models and physics and things that, that might be able to get us closer, you know, certainly, and then hopefully eventually there to really, you know, being able to understand some of this stuff. Right. Well, cool. Anything is possible. Totally. Well, like totally. Saying, anything is possible. And, you know, maybe we're just not ready yet for it. And that's why we haven't gotten to that point to see a lot of it yet. You know, you know, you get more sightings. I mean, people have cut down the the Bigfoot footage from what was it, nineteen sixty seven or something? That Patterson footage. Yeah. They they oh, have yeah, dissected sure. that till. I I don't know how much more you can dissect that, but my opinion, I don't think it's a hoax. I don't think it was fake. I don't think they even had the technology back in that time to do that on, on, a, on a reasonable budget. I mean, yeah. look at the movies. Hollywood, 
Planet of the Apes, 1960-something, the Planet of the Apes movies, you could tell those were costumes. Yep. Sure. Now, I've observed that Patterson footage, I don't know how many times. I, I'm willing to guess hundreds, maybe thousands I've examined it. You definitely see muscle foot footage, you know, movement, yep. muscle movement. Pretty damn good costume. We can't even it make it. would be hard to reproduce today. Day. Right. Yeah. It's still hard to produce today, reproduce that. that They've tried on like Panchee and stuff and they can't do it. Right. Yeah, well, because like in, in the, the proportions are too different from a, a human being, you know, like it's it, the, the arms are too long, you know, like right. you just you can't fake stuff like that. You couldn't fake stuff like that at, at that time, like no. at, at least not that realistically. So, yeah, I mean, that's one for me that um, it remains unexplained as far as and I'm then, concerned. It, it seems mm -hmm. legitimate. I don't know. And then you take when that was shown for the first time and stuff in 1960, there was no computers. There was no Photoshop. There was no, you know, readily available to everybody. You could, I mean, that was on actual film that had to be developed. Oh yeah. You know, you know, they recorded it in, in an old fashioned, you know, whatever. And it ended up on real to real. Oh yeah, you know, that, that was yeah, old. Was film. Like eight that was old, or old film, yeah, eight millimeter type yes. film that had to be developed. Yeah, absolutely. So and no, yeah, I, I, I don't think there's much room for tampering, old tampering old. with that film. For yeah, sure. I don't think it was tampered with in any way. You know, I I still believe that's the most realistic footage out there. You know. No, oh, yeah, I, I mean nothing's even close. Yeah, no. I would I would agree with that. Yeah, absolutely agree. Yeah. Oh, it looks like we're getting almost to a two-hour mark. I guess we're going to yeah. have to call it. <laughs> uh, well, we're having you, a good class. time. And it was nice to meet you, Emily. Nice to meet um, you, too. Yeah. It's great to be uh, here. Come back anytime. You're welcome. And it was Absolutely. great. Absolutely. And you can find all of Tobias's adventures right there on that website, right? That's Absolutely. Cool. That's, that's the best place to find what, what whatever we're up to. What, whatever you're up to so. next. And what are you going to be up to next? That's a good question. Uh, I mean, as far as the immediate future, you know, just the that uh, continuation of the Lake Michigan Mothman investigation that we talked about. Um, and then, um, you know, we've got a documentary that uh, uh, we um, we were in with small town uh, produced by small town monsters called uh, on the trail of the Lake Michigan Mothman. That'll be coming up, I think, by the end of this year. I think it's early December. Yeah, I mean, we'll like, yeah, like we'll definitely let let people know. But yeah, that and that was exciting because Small Town Monsters is a great production company, and it was it was nice to work with them again because they're all fantastic. Um, and then you know, I I'm always bouncing around book ideas, so we'll 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 see what I end up going with. But um, I think we want to put out uh, a special edition of the, the Lake Michigan Mothman. Uh, high strangeness in the Midwest. Uh, and the reason for that is that the investigation has sort of progressed enough where I think um, we need to update like the, uh, the, the, the book that's out now. Um, but it's not enough where like, I would just write a whole new book about it. Uh, so maybe yeah. go back and, and, and revise this one, add a couple of new chapters, you know, put it in like a nice hardcover or something that'll look great on a bookshelf. Different and, look to it. Yeah, let me know if you want my story. I'll get my friend to uh, tell it with me for you. That would, honestly, regardless, I definitely want that uh, because it would, you know, it would be an excellent article. And uh, the real benefit of those articles is that it usually leads to other people coming forward with, you know, with their stories too. So mm -hmm. absolutely, um, you can reach out to us. You know, obviously, you cool. hopefully know how to get a hold of us, but you know, you can get a hold of us through the the, the website too. So you know, That's we have great. all info on there but uh yeah don't please do that, right. would, that would be fantastic so. cool and don't forget to check out time on off the rails what are you guys we, we'll next? be live we'll be live tomorrow we just got done with our veterans day uh we got a comedy event coming december 11th for the big brothers big sisters of ozaki oh, county great. yeah it's gonna be uh december 11th so and we're still working on Twisted Dreams and Pop Culture Podcast. Uh, we're really yeah, hooked up on so. that Pop Culture Podcast. I got to get yeah. on there someday. Heck yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Nice meeting you guys. Yeah, it's great to meet you too. And thank, thank you. you.
again for coming Thank on. You. Always great to see you, Joe. And I don't have nothing for Tuesday yet, but uh, Mark will be back Tuesday. So Mark will be back with us next week. So whether that's a good thing or not, who knows? <laughs> We've had a, I've had a couple of great uh, co-hosts, even though the one kind of had a power outage on us about halfway through. Poor Chris. <laughs> anyway, um, stay safe and just remember anything's possible and everybody have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.